a lot of what happens when you have something for a long time is very similar to what the children of Israel went through when they were in the land and blessed by God. In America, we had God shed his grace upon us. It didn't happen as though it were some miracle that America suddenly was discovered and then men, as they were inspired by God and greed and profit and other purposes, desired to produce a utopian society, a nation that would be not regulated by the laws of authority or autocratic rule, but rather by a conglomerate rule of the masses of the people, a socialistic expression of man's will working cooperatively together that we would change into called democracy. But it would be a valuation that was determined upon a philosophy that somehow there would be an expectation of a morality that would not exist in all people. Because as much as Christians want to say that our founding fathers were perfect in every way, the fact is a lot of them were ungodly men and were more interested in profit and doing what they could do to insulate themselves from others affecting or infecting their business than they were so much so about God's will. And that's a lot like today. We have religion and religion will go its own way and determine for itself its own prosperity as well as its own poverty. Sometimes it wants to protect itself rather than do the will of God. And each and every one of us have to examine ourselves to find if we're the same way. Are we looking at today being walking and talking with God and having fellowship with Him, or are we trying to protect ourselves, to insulate ourselves, to make ourselves distant from the world and its ways? Because the reality is that's who we were. It's not who we are. Sometimes in the latter days, especially in these days that we live in, when we think that there's so bad and it's gotten so worse, that God already warned us that the greatest time of all the world's ever experiences combined into one would never be as bad as the seven year tribulation or three and a half years of tribulation that's going to come upon the world. And never will it happen again. We think somehow that because things are getting worse in the world, that somehow Christianity has failed. And there was that attitude and that action that had gone on for so long that in a nation that God had shed his grace upon, the nation itself in its organized religion had determined that God was dead. And even the world in America, Christendom itself, as an organized faith and religion had determined within its own theologians that God was dead. And it was mentioned on Time Magazine. And it was funny because about that time, God said, no, I'm not. And the Jesus movement exploded on the scene around the world. It wasn't just in America or American phenomenon. But it happened at the same time as things were being made manifest in Israel. Things were happening in Israel. And if you compare the Jesus movement or you check, compare the church age to what was going on with the Jewish nation, whether it dispersed or not, you'll find there's a great corollary between the great revivals and what was happening in the Jewish nation. At the turn of the century when Zionism was born and the desire to go back into the land, Pentecostalism exploded. The Holy Spirit started what we call the latter reign. About 120 years later, you know, we had another explosion, so to speak, the Jesus movement. So there were different things that happened. Same thing with Zionism, is that originally Zionism began, and then 120 years later, bingo, we had the capital of Jerusalem united in 1967. And 1967 also happened to be interesting in the Jesus movement. You could do your research to figure that one out. You know, it's kind of a fun prophecy and end time study. But the point is, God has always been in control. There's never been a time where God has not had his people, where there has not been faithful men and women of God serving him and walking with him. When you look at the children of Israel, you see that there were men 
and women of God, even when they felt like they were all alone, like an Elijah complex, oh, I'm the only one. And God says, no, you're not. I got, you know, all kinds of prophets that are still left around, you know, that you're not the only one. So don't, don't get a, you know, complex. Today we have that complex sometimes. We think that somehow America is no less a nation of Christians than it once was, but that somehow the propaganda machine that we are influenced by, our informational age input devices, whether they be iPhones or telephones or whether they be texting or radio, whether it be television or eyewitness accounts yourself watching the news, we're very much influenced by information, not necessarily keeping a proper perspective on what we're reading or evaluating. Because the signs of the times are about us, and it will happen. But the promise that Jesus said was always there. Not that we would despair, but that we would recognize the hope of our calling. That we would see the opportunity to be a witness in these latter days of what God can do as opposed to what man has done. Because you see, when there's more people on the world, and we know there's over 7 billion, then it sometimes looks like, wow, because there's more non-Christian or non, I should say religious of a non-Christian nature, that somehow Christianity isn't successful. And that's not true. God has always been stating from the beginning until the end that there would be the gospel going forth. That it would go forth into all nations. And the angels will do that in the book of, in the book of Revelation as it's mentioned there during the Great Tribulation. That we would see the gospel finally accomplished. That it would go into the, all the world. It would be proclaimed by the angels in heaven flying through the heavens. Those aren't satellites. Those are angels. <laughs> so the point is when you hear Christians suddenly go, oh, well, the church has failed, or you know, somehow the church isn't doing its job, or people aren't you know, as faithful as they are, or there's sugar-coated Christianity, don't be deceived. God is always and always has been faithful to his people. Many are called, few are chosen, but the reality of walking with God has always been as obvious as the sunrise and the sunset. As much as there's day follows after day, God promised that he would not leave you alone, that he would not let you go astray, that he would bring you back to him if you would just seek him with all your heart. That all you'd have to do is just call upon the Lord. And that by his grace and mercy that he's given you, he would bring you back to himself as a wayward child. No child that I know of would, you know, automatically run away from being blessed, encouraged, strengthened, you know, uh, taught, cared for, loved, hugged, appreciated, you know, they would always come back to that. And even the Bible says that, train up a child in the way that they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart. In other words, there may be a time where they're going off to discover their own way and their own things, but they'll always come back to the right way, eventually. And that's why God has promised us certain things in the scriptures that have foretold that we too would be like sheep gone astray when the master was struck down but that we would come back to him because we would see him risen as we do after the resurrection in our lives because even as we see Jesus at 33 and a third years dying we don't see him as the end of Christianity but rather all of a sudden the real life of God in us began because Jesus came back to us and told us that this was all meant to be. It was supposed to happen this way and that he would give us the Holy Spirit to reveal the end times and to reveal himself and what he meant by what he said. And so we see now in these latter days living as we are in such a time as this that there's no reason to think that oh no America's no no nation of Christians because we see a different policy. We see a different power in control. We see a different government than what we claim to want. And the world seems to want something different. But we as believers, because we believe, because we know the word of God, because we are confident that what God has said he will do, he will also perform, then we know that the gates of hell, even themselves, shall not prevail against his church. Because you see, it's not about what you think, but what 
he has done. It's over as far as he's concerned. He won. It was accomplished on the day that he died. Everything was completed. Even Jesus said it from the cross. It is finished. The reality of what we're doing now is just declaring to everyone that it is done. It has been accomplished. Everything you need for godliness, for holiness, for worship, for relationship, for religion, for everything there is in life, as well as eternal life to come, has been accomplished in the Son. Jesus did it all. There's nothing more that really needs to be done. Now, we demonstrate our faith by the actions that we do and living out that salvation that's been given to us freely through grace. We prove and approve that we are worthy vessels to be treated as such that we are vessels of honor and not of wrath, and that wrath will not come upon us because God has promised that he would take care of us. But we have that opportunity to prove whether or not, or approve the work of God that's in us, by our actions and the things we do with what we've been given. Because you see, you can't just trample under the feet the word of God or the grace that you've been given, but rather you appreciate and you respect and you give thanks for what God has done in your life. Because even as the children of Israel were set aside for a season, he didn't abandon them. Oh, there are those that may have died in rebellion that have gone to hell. But the children of Israel in the long term shall all be saved. It doesn't mean that everyone that's Jewish will be saved. In that day, they will be. But if they don't live that far, guess what? <laughs> Any soul that dies without Jesus goes to hell. But the reality of our nation, the reality of America, as far as being a nation of Christians, because it's never been a Christian nation. There's no such thing as a Christian nation. We use that to say and to designate that a nation is influenced by Christian morality or Christian theology or a Christian mindset. And to this day, we are that nation. We have been and always shall be a nation of Christians that the foundations as well as the facts of what we live by are influenced by that morality that comes from biblical knowledge as well as scriptural application in our legal system as well as our moral code. But just because civil code changes and determines for itself the majority of what people want doesn't mean that they'll always stay that way. Because if you're like me, you've seen over time, even with baby boomers, where everything was about peace, love, and joy and dropping out of society, you know, having only those things that we want to feel good, be good, enjoy, you know, we didn't want to be, you know, putting up boundaries that everybody could just have free love. And we found it failed. And we changed our ways. And we became different, whether it be yuppie or whether it be, you know, part of the establishment or whether it be, you know, born again. We discovered that we too had, like this generation, changed society. And then we changed it again. And you'll watch society's little barometer change all the time. Up and down, popular opinions change and rearrange themselves according to what the popular vote is. But that doesn't change what God has said. God is faithful to perform all that he has promised in his word. That being that, yes, there will always be those who don't want God. And there will always be those who do want God. And as long as the sun rises and the sun sets, as long as day follows day, Jesus said it and God promised it that we would have an assurance that his word would always be fulfilled. No burial in sight for the faith of our fathers. Interesting title. <laughs> you have to think about it. No burial in sight for the faith of our fathers. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Hebrews 12.23 Sounds Jewish. <laughs> In case you didn't know, the book of Hebrews is written to Jews. That's the idea. Hebrews is Jewish. You know, I mean, that's kind of like, you know, goes without saying. I hope. There is a notion abroad that Christianity is on its last legs, as though it were going to fail, or possibly already dead and just too weak to lie down, as though the popular polls were all 
not coordinated by a sampling of some people as though the polls were all people and they're not. Maybe you didn't realize this, but whenever they take a poll, whenever you see these polls that are done, they take a sampling of a certain amount of people and they say, okay, we're going to take 10 people and let's say the population of the nation is 100. Pretty easy to figure out, 10, 100. Okay, so we're going to take 10 people. 10 times 10 is 100, so we're just going to take 10 people and we're going to ask them a question. Do you believe in God? Now, if they went to a community, let's say, that was a closed community, you know, closed community, like let's just say Utah, just for the sake of argument, you know, and it was a very Mormon-oriented, you know, community, very tight, you know, that everybody was watching everybody and making sure that everybody was very Mormon and going to church and doing everything that the Mormon church says. Well then, of course, if I went into that community and asked 10 families, do you believe in God? Those 10 families would say, you betcha, and Joseph Smith is a prophet of God, you know, I mean, that's what they'd say, you know, but anyways, they would all say of those 10 people, yes, they believe in God. So then I could say, well, okay, since there's 100 people in the world, 10 times 10 is 100. We have 100% in the world believe in God. And that would be an accurate poll because it's a sampling poll. All polls today by pollsters are done that way. They take a sampling. They try to say they're fair by taking certain amounts of people from different communities and pretend or contend or argue that that's an accurate picture of America. No, it's not. If you're not asking every single human being in America exactly the same question and getting exactly the response you think, people are variable. They change their minds even. They even come from different communities and assemble themselves in different ways. And so polls are always biased and not accurate. Even when they say they're accurate to 3% or 10%, they're guessing. It's not accurate either. It's just a sampling poll. So don't think that the Word of God is like a sampling poll or that somehow these polls compare to the Bible or compare to what God has said. It's not true. What God has said is accurate because he sees the heart. Man looks on the outward things. So this notion that Christianity is on its last legs is pretty silly in a lot of ways because it's based on opinions, not facts. In the minds of many who do not understand Christianity, the chief proof of her death is said to be her failure to provide leadership for the world just when she needs it most. When we look at leadership today, we claim that even our leader isn't Christian, though he goes to church. What a fallacy. A fallacy is a false idea promoted in order to cause people to believe something else rather than the facts. It's a fallacy. The president himself is a religious man he exercises the Christian religion. I don't know about his personal relationship. I don't get that personal. But because I don't have personal relationship with him, I don't know about his personal relationships. Do you see how that works? If you're not personally related to that person, then you don't know, but God does. Let me say that those who would come forward to bury the faith of our fathers have reckoned without the host, without the father. In other words, the faith of our fathers is based upon our Father in Heaven, not upon, guess what, the example of what people are trying to call the Founding Fathers. Just as Jesus Christ was once buried away with the full expectation that he had been gotten rid of, so his church has been laid to rest many times without number, and as he frustrated his enemies by rising from the dead, so too the church has confounded hers by springing again to vigorous life after all the wow good word obsequies 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 that's a good word i don't know that one i i pride myself on knowing a lot of english and archaic words don't know that one obsequious is what i'm thinking it comes from obsequious i understand but there, I didn't know that obsequious could be conjugated to obsequi, obs, obsequies, which is what I'm imagining you say. I'm not sure. I know obsequious is correct. But, <laughs> has confounded hers by springing again to the vigorous life after all the obsequies, 
had been performed over her coffin and the crocodile tears had been shed at her grave. Nice word. <laughs> I may have to look that one up. Christianity is going the way her founder and his apostles said it would go. What God has said, God will perform. Its development and direction were predicted almost 2,000 years ago, and this itself is a miracle, and it has gone according to exactly the way God has said. Had Jesus been less than God and his apostles less than inspired, they could not have foretold with such precision the state of the church so far removed from them in time and circumstance. The actual church is the repository of the life of God among men, and if in one place the frail vessels fail, the life will break out somewhere else. Of this we may be sure. Any time that God was contained in some kind of manifested destiny of reality that man makes God fit into a box of his own comprehension and understanding, then God steps outside the box and causes something new to spring forth. We see that a lot, for instance, with the Catholic Church when it tried to keep so much organized religion in one place at one time. It sprung forth other places. It could not be stopped. It was like when you water the dirt. You don't know if there's any seeds in there. You don't know if there's any weeds in there. But boy, when you water the dirt and you let the sun shine on it and it gets warm, you see all kinds of things grow up. Some good, some bad. God is like that. The world is a field and lots of things are growing. But God will go out and plant seeds where we don't know. God will cause things to grow that we don't understand or comprehend. And he will be the one who causes the rain to shine, uh, the rain to shine, the sun to shine, and the rain to fall on the wicked and the good, and cause the wheat to grow up with the tares and wheat that we did not know was planted there. So don't think that the church somehow is failing or somehow is at the end because you know you've read something in the book of Revelation where one church of the seven is listed as being lukewarm. God's walking in the midst of all seven of them and all seven of them had blessings. Some things God challenged and said, look, you need to clean this up, clean up this act, you know, in order to be better than what they were. But they did know the Lord. That's the point. They did get saved. The reality of where we are and what we are is the fact that God, not man, is in control. The sooner you realize that, the better you'll feel about every day as opposed to being led your way. Because when you accept the fact that God has it his way, then the things that men and women do when they try to say is failing or falling apart, they have no idea who they're talking about because God is always in control. I like to think of that song that, you know, I heard when I was a child. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. Sing it again. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. Take it down. He's got the whole world. <laughs> but you know what I mean. He does. So rejoice. Be glad. God's in control. You're not.